Well, good evening. Good to see everyone here tonight. I want to extend a warm welcome to our visitors. We're glad you're with us. Also good to see those that were not here this morning that were able to see again. This lesson is in fulfillment of a request and is simply titled Consequences of AD 70 Doctrine. It's not one of my more clever titles, but it's a title that says exactly what we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, some questions arose on this doctrine during one of our Sunday morning adult Bible classes, and I was requested to speak about this doctrine so that we might be more familiar with it and the, the dangers of it, and I decided to approach it in a different light. Rather than talk about all the ins and outs and how of what it is and how they arrive at their different uh, points of doctrine, we're going to look at Matthew 7, 13 to 14, and 1 Corinthians 15, and look at the road that a doctrine such as this leads to. And so we're going to be looking at the consequences of a doctrine such as AD 70. As is the nature of any type of lesson that I present on some kind of topic like this, where we are refuting some error, we do want to approach it from a matter of, from a, a place in our hearts of love. We want to do it gently. And as I like to also say before we begin any type study such as this, if there are any questions or comments or any other concerns after studying something like this, please feel free to see Chuck. No. <laughs> I mean, you can come see me. I, I make myself available at any time for such things. So if there are anything, any questions in your minds left unanswered as we go through this, please feel free to get together with me. If it's something we can't answer tonight, I will make time for you. I want to begin by, if you look at this picture, this picture kind of summed up exactly what I was thinking as I put this together. It's a guy in a car who those who may not be able to read what he's thinking in his mind in the back. There's a sign that on the road saying sin, an exit that says repent, and the highway billboard saying where he's going is destruction ahead. And as he looks to that exit that says repent, he says, I think I'll take the exit. Now something that we're going to be looking at tonight is as we look down the road, to where a thing leads, we often need to be aware of where the exit is if we find ourselves on that road and we're not happy with where it leads. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. I encourage you to read it along with me. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus is telling us that there are two roads in life. Now, sometimes we think we've taken option C. There is no option C. It is either A or B. It is the narrow road or it is the broad road. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to come up with other options beyond B, there are only two. Jesus says one leads to destruction. The other will lead to eternal life. It is important for us on any road that we are on to look ahead at where we're going and what it leads to and make sure that if it's not going in the direction we want it to, to take the exit when the opportunity arises. So we're going to look down the road, so to speak, at the 8070 doctrine and see where it leads so that we might look before we leap, as an idiom that we use today, that we might look before we leap. The false 8070 doctrine has gained ground in many states. It's a battle being fought in many churches. This particular topic hits very close to home for me. Just years Within a few years, after Becky and I moved from Washington State, where I had been for nine years, from where we moved there to Alaska, within a few years, we heard that the congregation that I was at was battling this AD 70 doctrine from the point of view of the preacher. The preacher had introduced it to the congregation. He was a man I looked up to and respected. Before long, within the year, I was hearing from friends throughout the state that their congregations were battling this as well. And I'm sad to say, the congregation that I was that Becky and I were members of is no longer around. It was split many times until it was finally destroyed, and those that remained changed their name. The 8070 doctrine is insidious, and it has, it has swept through like wildfire in different areas. But it's not new. It goes back to 1971, as we're going to point out. So I just want to briefly tell you what it is for those who may not have been in that adult Bible class with us, for those who may not be aware of what it is. It's from a book called The Spirit of Prophecy, written by a man named Max R. King. The book dates to 1971. As with any type of book that's published, I give that date that it was published, but these ideas were floating around long before that. 
he put it together and so he's often credited as the founder of this movement but it places the emphasis of bible prophecy on the nation of israel and not jesus it states the culmination of all prophecy was fulfilled in the destruction of jerusalem in AD 70 not the death the burial and the resurrection of christ i would challenge this with luke 24 verse 44 jesus said that all things had to be fulfilled in him concerning the law the prophets and the psalms he left no room for doubt that everything in the old covenant pointed to him all things had to be fulfilled in his death and then he left one last promise two last promises at that time he said jerusalem will fall you can go to matthew 24 luke 17 and luke 21 a couple other places where he alludes to it he says jerusalem is going to fall and he says he will return again and that's what we talked about this morning the hope of the empty tomb is that he had the power over death and as such he is the first fruit of the resurrection we too will be resurrected but they state the emphasis is the destruction of jerusalem not the death burial and resurrection of christ and the following events of the growth of the church after the day of pentecost which is uh, which is recorded for us in the whole book of acts it states that every prophecy concerning the completeness of the kingdom, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and judgment were fulfilled in A.D. 70. Part of teaching this doctrine, they teach that Revelation was written in 68 to 69 A.D. and was not prophesying the fall of Rome, but prophesying the fall of Jerusalem. And you have to ask yourself, what, what comfort would there be to Gentile Christians throughout Asia to hear of the fall of Jerusalem. I'll leave you to ponder that. AD 70's destruction of Jerusalem was the end of the world, the end of the age, as they teach. There remains no other prophecy to be fulfilled. Again, I have not intended this lesson to look at all the different prophecies they look at in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Matthew 24, Luke 17, and Luke 21, as they misapply many of those texts to fit their doctrine. They twist and turn any reference to the resurrection to mean, as we're going to see, the church resurrecting after AD 70 with the death of Jerusalem. We're not going to look at all of that. Mostly what we're going to be spending time is intended to show the consequences and the inconsistencies from these positions. To look down the road, so to speak, and see where it leads. To be prepared ourselves if this doctrine were to ever be knocking on our doors. So the question we're going to be looking at tonight is where does this doctrine take us and what conclusions does it force us to make one of the first things and these are in no particular order these are just the way i put them down on paper to guide my thoughts so i'm we're going to be studying it that way but these are in no particular order we could look at it from any different angle but one of the first things that came to my mind is that it can teach one to deny the literal resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is a conclusion that one can make from this doctrine, and it comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24. This morning, we read all the way through verse 19 and talking about that Jesus Christ did raise from the dead. If he did not raise from the dead, we are above all men to be pitied. Our faith is worthless. We are in our sins. There is no hope. But that Christ did raise from the dead, therefore there is hope, because he did rise on the third day. So in verse 20, kind of picks up as a continuance from where we were looking at this morning. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Now what this is teaching is Christ is the first fruits of the dead, meaning his resurrection is the guarantee of a future resurrection of all people. John chapter 5 talks about the wicked and the righteous will both rise. They will come out of their tombs. They will meet God, but two different fates. <clears throat> We're told here in this passage that in Christ, all will be made alive and those who are Christ at his coming. The AD 70 doctrine, to fit this, that a resurrection and judgment all happen in AD 70, they teach that those made alive were not individuals, but the church, 
This doctrine says those in Adam that died was really Jerusalem in a figurative sense in AD 70. Jerusalem did was destroyed. Je just as Jesus prophesied, he said, not one stone of the temple would be left on top of another. As the Romans breached the city walls and they went into the city, Josephus records and many other historians record for us that supposedly there was an accidental fire in the temple. The Romans did not intend to burn the temple, but an accidental fire happened. You remember that Herod had in overlaid it with gold. The gold began melting and running in the streets, and that's when the Romans then intentionally fanned those flames, so to speak, so they could gather up every ounce of gold that ran into the streets until, as Jesus prophesied, not one stone was left on top of another. It was utter destruction. And the Jews were dispersed. And then they were dispersed again in 132 AD under the Emperor Hadrian when they revolted one more time. And it was in that revolt that the Hadrian took away the name Judea and renamed it Palestine. But in 70 AD, Jerusalem, we could say, died. And what died there was the Jewish covenant. Even today, those that claim to be of the Jewish faith, they have rabbis and teachers. They do not have priests because no one can trace their lineage back to Levi. The records were destroyed, utterly annihilated in 70 AD. It really was the abolishment of the Jewish covenant in 70 AD. So complete was that destruction. And so the, those that teach this doctrine teach that those that died in Adam was really the Jewish covenant and the body raised to life in Christ was the church. And they apply that figuratively. That now the church is handed over. This is the kingdom handed over to God. The church was those that belonged to God. And what happens is they limit then all rule and all authority concerning the Jewish leaders. You remember where we just read, he says, he'll hand over the kingdom to God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. They limit that all rule and all authority and all power to the Jewish leaders, not to all power, all authority. If the body to be raised in 1 Corinthians 15 is not man's literal body, but a figurative reference to the church, then why must we believe in a literal resurrection of Christ's body? And here's where that doctrine is very dangerous in teaching that it's not something literal, it's figurative, because the first proves the latter. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the guarantee that there will be a resurrection of the dead of our bodies, our souls. So if the latter fruit is not the literal raising of mankind, then there's no reason to believe the first fruits was also literal. And there are those that will reach this conclusion. And so that's why I say this conclusion can lead one to deny the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if that is true, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, then we of all men are most to be pitied. Can we be a Christian and accept that position? And I would say, of course not. Paul says we can't. This isn't my opinion. Paul says we cannot accept the position that there is no resurrection of the dead, that Christ did not raise from the dead, because then we're dead in our sins. There is no hope. We've put our faith and our trust and our hope and a dead man, if that's the case. But then he says in verse 20, but Christ has raised from the dead. He is the guarantee, the proof that there will be one to come. And 1 Corinthians 15, 19 does say, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then we above all men are to be pitied. It is a dangerous position in saying no literal resurrection of mankind. Because if there's no literal resurrection of mankind, there's nothing stopping us from believing there was no literal resurrection of of Jesus. The second thing that I want to say about that is if one will not accept this position, then they ought to reject the doctrine that calls it even into question and causes one to arrive at that conclusion. And you're going to get tired of seeing this slide. It might be worded a little bit differently, but you're going to see it a lot tonight. The second thing about the AD 70 doctrine is no more baptism. I want you to look in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, they teach that the end of the age happened in A.D. 70. If that's the case, then Jesus' promise here is fulfilled. 
He said, I am with you always to the end of the age. If that end of the age happened in AD 70, why are we baptizing today? That's a consequence of this doctrine. Baptism was only the last until the end of the world or the end of the age. The AD 70 doctrine teaches that age Jesus was speaking of ended in AD 70. If that's the case, the commission no longer stands. We don't need to go and teach. We have no more authority to baptize believers. Yet those that teach this doctrine still insist men must be baptized for salvation today. There's a tract, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. But the name of the tract is called The Second Coming of Jesus, Part 6, by Argol Drollinger. He's a teacher of AD 70, and he famously took this tract, went to India, and had a hard time convincing people of this doctrine. In fact, he later wrote that he was persecuted by the Indians because he, they would not accept his teaching. And these tracts were being thrown back at him. But he taught in this tract, The Second Coming of Jesus, Part 6, that one must be baptized for the forgiveness of sins still today. That he didn't even see the inconsistency of the very doctrine that he teaches. I say again, if one will not accept this position, then they ought to reject the doctrine that causes one to arrive at such a conclusion. Thirdly, there's no more observance of the Lord's Supper. In the tract, the second coming of Jesus, part six, by Argol Drollinger, that teacher of 87 and went to India, infamously, I might add. He states in there that baptism is a part of the plan of salvation and that worship is still the same. It says saints must still partake of the Lord's Supper. And he cites 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. So these are the passages, and we're going to read these, that he cites as authority for the church still today to partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's read it. We read this very often. These should be very familiar passages to us, and rightly so. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To this point, if we are reading this tract or hearing this man teach, we could give an amen. Yes, we believe that too. We are to partake of it. But this tract stops one verse short. And we're going to read that next verse. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. Putting it in the full context here, verses 23 to 25, we just read. So read verse 26 after saying, Do this in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until what? Until he comes. What do they teach? That he came in A.D. 70. And that his coming was in judgment. There's an interesting account from Josephus. Josephus was the man we quoted a little bit earlier this morning. Talked about he's a non-Christian, but he was a Jewish historian. He states that as he stood back, he was a general in the Roman army, by the way. And he had tried to negotiate peace for a few years until his own Jewish brethren in Jerusalem shot an arrow into his knee. And Titus, the commander of the army, said that's it. And that's when the kid gloves came off. No diplomatic, no mercy. They went in, breached the walls, and it was over. But Josephus describes that at that moment, right before the Roman army charged into the wall, Josephus says he looked up, and many Roman commanders looked up with him into the sky, and they saw what looked like chariots in the clouds and they parted and peeled back away from Jerusalem and they all standing there with him interpreted that as God removing his protection from the city many of those that teach 80, the 8070 doctrine say that sign in the sky was Jesus's coming in judgment and that all eyes saw him in the clouds but I want you to see what the consequence is as far as Christians still today partaking of the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If he came in A.D. 70, there is no need, there is no authority to partake of the Lord's Supper today. What about after he comes? It's no longer necessary. We know from other passages, 1 John 3, 2 says we're going to see him 
like he is. We're going to see him face to face. First Thessalonians 4.17 says we're always going to be with him. So when he comes again, we'll always be with him. There will be no more need to partake of the Lord's Supper to do in remembrance of him. We will be with him. John 14, he says, where I go, I go to prepare a home for you. If I'm preparing a home for you, I'm coming to get you. If I come to get you, it's to take you home with me. So if he comes again, there's no need for the Lord's Supper. And that fits with what Paul said. What does not fit with what Paul said is that his coming was in A.D. 70. We're not waiting for a second. We're not waiting for another coming. If that's the case, the consequence of this doctrine is he's already, it's already happened. We do not need to partake of the Lord's Supper. So my question is, why do they still partake of the Lord's Supper? What text can they go to that speaks of taking the Lord's Supper after he comes? If one will not accept this position, they should reject the doctrine that causes one to arrive at that conclusion. But not only can it cause one to deny the literal resurrection of Christ, not only does it tell us there is no more baptism or no more observance of the Lord's Supper, we can also come to the conclusion that there's no more persecution. Look at me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read 4 through 10, but there's room on the slide for verses 4 to 4 to 6, and so the next slide will be 7 to 10, so we're going to read it in two slides. It says, therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So the context here, that's why I want us to read verse 4. The context there is he's talking about saints who are enduring persecution and affliction. He says in verse 5, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you'll be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you're suffering. If you go back to Acts chapter 5 and you find that the apostles were captured by the Sanhedrin in chapter 4, they were imprisoned and they said, then they were brought back before them and said, you're free to go, but do not preach in Jesus' name. They, an angel tells them, go back to the temple and preach in Jesus' name. They do exactly that. They're brought back before the Sanhedrin. They said, we told you not to do this. You did it anyway. They have them flogged or scourged and then sent on their way. And you remember what they did? They went away rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer as Christ suffered and for the cause of Christ. He's saying here, this is God's righteous judgment, so you'll be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you're suffering. Persecution, affliction, suffering, as we've talked about over and over and over again, Jesus promised this would happen to his people. And when it happens, we ought to have the attitude of the apostles. As Paul is telling the Thessalonian brethren, we're to rejoice in it. He says, for after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day. And to be marveled at among all who have believed, for a testimony to you was believed. Paul said when Jesus comes on that day, he will deal out retribution to the wicked. He'll give relief. New King James, King James says rest. So he'll give relief, rest to the saints. This rest will be accomplished by the removal and punishment of those who are persecuting the saints. Not only them, but two categories of people, those who do not know God, and those who have never obeyed the gospel. It says of those people in, that, in those two categories, verse 9, they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Well, that's the point. If that day was in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem, well, then persecution should cease. Persecution should have gone away at that day, just as it says. If the second coming of Jesus was in AD 70, that day should have given relief or rest to the saints. All saints should be at rest. And then, I haven't heard it taught this way, but just playing devil's advocate, so to speak, if someone were to say, well, that day referred to AD 70, taking away those persecutors, the Jews. Were the Jews the only source of persecution of Christians? Not even by AD 70. Persecution arose under Nero. Nero trying to cover his tracks and burning Rome and blaming it on the Christians. We're told he had 3,000 Christians covered with pitch, crucified and lit on fire 
to light the way to his palace for a party. Were the Jews the only source of persecution that God was promising here to give relief to and from? It doesn't fit the context. If it was only local, then where are the texts promising comfort for saints afterward? History and current events refute this very idea. Persecution of saints from all different kinds of sources still exists today, and there are still hostility towards Christians, and in some places of the country, or in some places of the world, Christians are still put to death and faced with a terrible choice, according to man's standards. Deny Christ and live, confess him and die. But that's nothing new. That is what Christians have been faced with from the first century. History and current events refute this very idea. So if one will not accept this position, that there's no more persecution, then we ought to reject the doctrine that causes one to come to that conclusion. This one you might say, now I'm stretching. But if you were to look at the 8070 doctrine, you would be forced to conclude there's no more marriage. Look with me in Luke chapter 20, 34 to 35. And the next point, if you think I'm missing a verse, don't worry. We're going to pick up the next verse and the next point. In Luke chapter 20, 34 to 35, Jesus said to them, this is in answering a question about the resurrection. They came to him and gave him, uh, they were trying to trap him and they gave him some hypothetical situation from the, from the old law about a, uh, a wife that had seven brothers as her husband. And they said, since she, married, she was married to all of them in the resurrection, Whose husband will she be? She was the wife of all seven of these brothers. And so Jesus says to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. For those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, notice the language here, attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, not leaving it to mistake. He's talking about the end time, the judgment day, when the resurrection of the dead takes place. He says neither they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So, Jesus said the resurrection, in the resurrection, people will neither marry or be given in marriage. He said marriage would end at his second coming, at the resurrection of the dead. It won't happen. So he's saying their question is moot. The answer is there won't be a marriage there. But the 8070 doctrine teaches the resurrection took place at the destruction of Jerusalem. If that is the case, marriage ought to have ceased. Why do people still get married today, including, including teachers that believe the 8070 doctrine? If that age, if that resurrection of the dead is not something we're waiting for to come, but happened in AD 70, Jesus said when that happened, marriage would cease. My question is, why do followers of this false doctrine still get married today and perform weddings? Today. Again, if one will not accept this position, we need to reject the very doctrine that causes us to come to this conclusion. And you might say that this next point is even more ludicrous. But if we were to believe the 8070 doctrine, then we need to believe there's no more death. You might say to me, and now I'm really pushing it, but I told you we're going to read the next passage from Luke chapter 20. And that's in verse 36. After he says they cannot marry at the resurrection of the dead, he says, for they cannot even die anymore because they're like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Jesus isn't leaving it to our imagination of what age he's talking about here. He specifically stated the resurrection of the dead. And now he says they cannot die anymore. He's speaking about eternal life after the resurrection. We will never die being sons of the resurrection. Jesus said in the resurrection, people will never die. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15 and read with me verse 24. And we're going to read through verse 26. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it's evident he's ex that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And all the way through the end of this chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, 
He's talking about the resurrection from the dead. He says the last enemy to be abolished is death. If that age and that resurrection from the dead happened in A.D. 70, hallelujah, there's no more death. But if that is the case, then why do people still die today? Including teachers and believers of the A.D. 70 doctrine. Death is still too painful a reality for us to believe it has ended. Death still happens. Death is still a part of life because we have not attained to that age. The resurrection of the dead has not happened for all mankind yet. Again, if you say that is a crazy thing, then if one will not accept such a crazy position, then we ought not accept the doctrine that forces us into that conclusion. And the last thing I want to talk about this doctrine can force one to liter deny the literal resurrection of Christ. It can teach no more baptism, no more observance of the Lord's Supper, no more persecution, no more marriage, no more death. And if you really look into it, it gives mankind a license to sin. AD 70 advocates maintain that this, this, our life now, is heaven. We're not waiting for something else. I don't want to put words in their mouth. So I'm going to give you a direct quote from Max King, credited with giving us the 8070 doctrine in 1970s. He says this in the spirit of prophecy, which was written in 1971. Quoting now from his book, he says, A growing, developing relationship with God is the best definition of heaven I can think of at this time. Heaven is just joy and peace and right living, right thinking, right conduct. Heaven is part of your life now. And when you die, you live on and on and on. You'll never get any closer to heaven than that which you make in your own life. You've heard people talk about heaven on earth today. That's what Max King was saying. That this is it. This is all the heaven. That We're not going to get any closer to heaven than where you are in your life right now. Make the most of it. What this doctrine teaches is that this is heaven. We are already there. We can't sing songs about the second coming. We can't sing songs longing for heaven. We can't sing no tears in heaven, for it's already happened. Revelation 21, 3 through 4, God said of heaven, that new Jerusalem, that new heaven, that new earth, he says he will wipe away every tear. Are there still tears in this life? Absolutely. There are things in this life that grip us, that cause us to grieve and to mourn. And to weep openly. There are still tears in this life. We are not close to heaven in this life. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 18. Look with me in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. And tell me if this sounds like Paul is saying. Enjoy your life now. This is all it's going to ever be. He says for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. Are not worthy to be compared with the glory. That is to be revealed to us. Now, they might say, well, that was revealed in AD 70, and that was after Paul's time. What about those living afterwards? And that's where the license to sin comes in. If this is heaven, then there's no incentive or need to live a faithful and holy life. If you look in 2 Peter 3, 11 to 18, 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 3, he starts talking about the last days. And he says in verse 4, they're going to say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as it was from the beginning of creation. He's going to use the, the flood to remind them that God did flood the earth. And then he says in verse 8, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And he says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, 
because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. If this day and age has already happened, what are we looking forward to? What are you and I? This side of AD 70, if it's already happened, what are we looking forward to? We can't look for and hasten that day. It's already happened. We don't need to be in holy conduct looking for and hastening him. It already happened. What text can we turn to that tells us to live holy, righteously, and godly after Christ comes again? It's all in preparation for his coming. If he has already come, then the saints prior to AD 70 were the ones that needed to live in holiness, godliness, and righteousness. If this day has already come, we might ask, why bother? Why not enjoy the pleasures of life? Indeed, if this is heaven on earth, and we're to make it the most of what we want it to be, well, then why not take our pleasure now? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. And I, I didn't finish the thought there from verse 14 through 18, but in verse 18 tells us to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if we're to do that only until that day is of the Lord comes like a thief in the night and it's already happened, why do we need to grow? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. But again, if Peter's talking about that all these things were, were fulfilled in A.D. 70, then what about us on this side of it? What text can we turn to that tells us what defines our relationship to one another and to God after he comes again? When all the texts we read tell us the kind of conduct we're to have in preparation for his coming. If he has already come, then we have no preparation left to give. This doctrine is really a license to sin. There's no instruction for living after Christ comes again. There's nothing telling us to live righteously, godly, and sensibly in this present age. If you go to Titus chapter 2, in Titus chapter 2, In verse 11, Titus chapter 2, 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. If that age ended in A.D. 70, then this does not apply to you and me. This did not apply to the saints after 70 A.D. See the dangerous nature of this doctrine? If you really look at and take that road to its logical conclusion, then you and I don't need to be here today. You and I don't need to be careful about our conduct, that we live and walk in a worthy manner according to the gospel by which we're called. You and I don't need to live a worthy manner of the gospel by which we're called. You and I don't live, need to live righteously, godly, and sensibly in the present age because that age ended long, long ago. But if one will not accept this position, then we need to reject the doctrine that forces us to come to such a conclusion. As we conclude, not only is this doctrine to be rejected because of its false foundation, but because of the consequences of its conclusions that it will force people to take. As we look at this, the road that is going to be before us if we accept the tenets of this doctrine. These are the things we need to be aware of. These are the things we need to be prepared to talk to about our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones who have embraced such a doctrine. Any doctrine that has its followers contradicting themselves as much as this one does ought to be rejected. When considering various doctrines of the world, always look down the road that they lead. What conclusions will that doctrine force you to make? And if they are in contradiction and direct contrariness to the scriptures, then test the spirits and see if they are whether from God or if they are from men. And if you find that it is contradictory to scripture, knowing from 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, as Chuck led us in study this morning, that all scripture is inspired by God 
that is literally God breathed. And it's profitable for correction, for reproof, for rebuking, for exhortation to make the man of God complete for every good work. If it contradicts God breathed scripture, then it ought to be rejected. So, brethren, tonight, I encourage us to look down the road. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 place two roads before us, one that leads to destruction and one that leads to life. Let us look down the road in anything that we believe and make sure the conclusions that we have come to are in line with the scriptures. And if not, let us take the exit from the broad road to the narrow road. We need to be sure of where we are heading, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. The second coming of Jesus Christ has not already happened. There is a glorious future awaiting his saints, far greater than this life. As we read in Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider the suffering of this present world to be nothing in comparison to the glory to be revealed. Let us look for and hasten our Lord's return. As 2 Peter 3.12 tells us, what kind of people ought we to be in holiness and godly conduct? This evening, if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to be one. You can be one this very minute, this very hour, to repent of your sins, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins, rising from the waters of baptism, walking in newness of life, as Romans 6.4 says. This evening, if you're a Christian in error, not walking the way that you ought, Remember that we are called to walk godly, righteously, and sensibly in this present age. We are to walk in a worthy manner of the Lord. And if you have not been doing so, now is the time to make correction. And if we can assist you in any of these things, the waters of baptism, the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, we encourage you to come forward now and let your request be made known while we stand and while we sing.